my voters be represented in, and if other states don't follow the Constitution, and if their state legislature isn't responsible for overseeing their elections, and we have other people who are not under the Constitution, under the Constitution supposed to be doing this, it affects my state. And so our job is to make sure that the Constitution's followed and that every vote counts. And in this case, I'm not sure that every vote was counted, not in the right way. Let's go to the heart of this. Now, number one, let, let's start at the beginning. Article three of the Constitution lists a very small number of categories of cases that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction. In other words, this does not have to start at a lo lower court. Explain that in the context of now uh, their response to your suit earlier tonight. So it's a really important point that you're bringing up. In a state-on-state -state suit, our only place to go is the U.S. Supreme Court. We can't be heard anywhere else. Other lawsuits start at a district court level, and they have a right to be heard at least once, whether they have a good case or a bad case. So our request is we want to be heard. The only place we can go is the U.S. Supreme Court. And so we're pleading with the U.S. Supreme Court, please hear our case. Give us a chance at least to argue what we think is right. We want to argue the Constitution. Okay, now the Supreme Court has opined in the past that it may decline to accept the case, but you know, as we watched all of this unfold today, um, look, uh, we, we had a, a, a different possible outcome today. And that is, you know, we were waiting today to see if the court would, would or would not hear the case, and now we have a briefing schedule, correct? No, that's a, that's a good sign. I really appreciate that the court has asked the other states to respond so we have a chance hopefully after they respond to 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 go to the court and make our arguments on both sides and at least let the uh, supreme court make a decision on what is the law in this case uh, a question that they've never answered as it relates to the the facts that we're presenting this is the point now this is where you go into very specific detail about article two of the constitution and how they violated what we call the elector's clause uh, when executive or judicial officials and states changed the rules of elections or governing our elections. That is constitutionally as clear and unambiguous as anything in the Constitution that there is one body that has that constitutional authority and that would be the state legislatures. Sean, you make a really important point here. It is the responsibility of state legislatures per the Constitution to set the, the rules for election of electors. And in this case, those were overridden in the four states we're talking about were overridden by other officials, whether they were judges or other governmental officials. And that's not the way our constitution works. And that's the challenge we have in front of the court. Can this be overridden by uh, people who are not responsible under the constitution for doing this? Mr. Attorney General, can you explain how the electors clause in Georgia, Michigan, PA and Wisconsin were violated? Yeah, so in, in almost all those cases that we have, we have states that, that allowed mail-in ballots in cases they were not supposed to. They allowed for non-signature verification, which is really important. So when you, when you request a mail-in ballot, you have to sign for that, app, for that application, and then they'll verify when you send your ballot in on a sleeve of the ballot, usually they'll verify that signature to ensure that those two signatures match. Well, if you just waive those requirements, you have no way to go back and verify that the person that requested the application is the person voting. That's a pretty important thing. When in Pennsylvania, you go from 233,000 uh, mail-in ballots four years ago to 2.5 million, and the difference in the election was only oh 81,000. That's a very important issue to, to ignore. What's fascinating about this suit is at no point do you even have to go to the area of proving fraud, which I think was proven in a lot of these states, that's separate and apart. And, and those cases run independently in a lot of the states we're talking about. But let's talk about the second constitutional violation that you point out in your suit. And, and actually you rely on the landmark, landmark case of Bush v. Gore, where the Supreme Court held it violated the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment, and that when one, one Florida county treated ballots one way, that was, you know, chad, swinging, hanging, perforated, pimpled, and dimpled. Uh, and they did it differently from county to county, and voters had the constitutional right to have all ballots in the state of Florida treated equally county to county. Uh, explain how that comes into play in this suit. 
Well, I think that explains the wisdom of the Constitution requiring that a, a statewide body uh, of legislators make the rules instead of allowing county by county distinctions that are different where people are treated differently in different states. And I think that was part of the genius of what the founders put in place is making sure that everybody in the state was at least treated the same. In this case, in all four states, we have county by county distinctions that treated voters differently. And we therefore have 